Hello, I'm Jonathan Smith. I'm the lead pastor at One Church TO, and you're listening to the teaching time from our weekend gathering. We're an imperfect community of over 70 nationalities and five generations who are attempting to follow and shine Jesus in the greater Toronto area. Our vision, it's so simple. We want to help people from all walks of life know God, love people, and in turn, impact our city for good. We've designed these weekends to be meaningful, challenging, and encouraging, and I hope that's what you get from listening. Today we're going to talk about work, and I remember my first paying work experience. It was delivering papers for the Evening Times Globe and the Telegraph Journal in St. John, New Brunswick. I, I, I was recalling the events of that first job this last week, and I couldn't help but remember, I vividly remember my first day at work when a big truck pulled up in front of our house and out of the back came three large parcels of well-bound-together newspapers. I was so excited to get the wrapping off them, to put it into my newspaper bag and start my work-life experience. I was excited. And on Fridays was a special day because on Fridays I collected the fees that were owed for having delivered the papers that week. And I would come home kind of excitedly and I would uh, sit at the kitchen table and I would just kind of let all the coins spill out of my pocket and a few dollar bills that might be included in that. And my mom would always sit with me early on and she helped me keep a ledger of who paid and who didn't pay. And it was at that very kitchen table I learned a lot of lessons about work. And, you know, this was, uh, I learned on Fridays that it was show me the money time. I realized there's a correlation between money and work. And that excited me as a young worker. And my mom sat there and she looked at all the money and she said, well, this is what you owe to the newspaper company. Here's your money. And then she took and she taught me this at that kitchen table. 10% of this and she pushed it over because I didn't know how to do percentages. She pushed it over. She goes, now that's God's money. 10% of that's God's money. I'm so glad I learned that at an early age because it's as natural to me at 52 as it was when I was eight years old, to make sure that I recognize all this money is actually God's and I give him that portion. So I, 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 that 10% is over there. And then she said, 10%, that's for saving, Jonathan. You, you hold on to that, you save that up. And I was thrilled because 80% of it, I'd jump on my BMX bike, I would bike to Ted's Variety Store and I'd buy as much penny candy as I could find. Now, if you're younger here and you're wondering what a penny is, And what's penny candy? Ask someone older than you. All I can tell you, it was amazing. It was amazing. Penny candy was always amazing. Now, as I was kind of going through this uh, in my mind, I was not just remembering just the events. I wanted to remember how I felt. And I remember, honestly, I felt like a man. My dad went to work and he earned the bacon. And now I was going to work and I was earning well, a piece of bacon. <laughs> it wasn't a lot, but I felt like a man. And it was in that first job I learned responsibility. I learned it when it was storming out and I had to go out and deliver the papers anyway. I learned it, and maybe it was even harder on the really nice days when my friends were playing hockey or playing baseball and, and I had to go to work. And I learned the re- act of responsibility and how important it was. But I, I, I had to learn in that moment too, though, that money couldn't be my only motivator. After a few penny candy runs to Ted's Variety Store, it kind of lost its luster. It, was, it wasn't as dynamic and amazing as it once was. And so I, I learned to find pride in my work. I remember the moment with one particular neighbor when uh, they were smiling because I was always on time. And I realized, okay, me showing up and being dependable made their day. Or I was extra helpful. And I began to find joy in the act of actually working. It was that first job, that work experience that built and began to work, build my work ethic. Fel- followed me into the rest of my life. It was a very formational experience in my life. Now, every one of us today, listen, all of us have a relationship with work. We all are involved in work. You can't ignore work, whether it's domestic work. Some people get paid for it, but we all have to do it. It's the chores around the house that make the house work. It's domestic work. But many of us have volunteer work. And here at One Church CO, I know a lot of you volunteer in this church and you volunteer in the community through Love Army. Volunteer work is really important work. Or, and for many of us, it's paid work. 
whether blue collar or white collar work, it's work we get paid and compensated for that helps us live and build a life or build a career path in this life. So we're in this series called Hidden Costs. And the idea behind it is simply that there's a, there's a real price cost. There's, a, there's, there's a, the price tag cost. You know, when you go and you go into a store and you find an at- item and there's a price tag on it, and then there's the real cost. You know, when you go to the cash register and they add the taxes and the, maybe the hidden fees or the service fees that are in there, and then you get to understand what the real cost is in life, how it adds up. Here's, here's what we're doing in this series. We're acknowledging that life is good at showing us price tag costs. Really good at that. And while keeping the hidden, the real price costs or the real life costs. See, often in life, if you're on social media, you can follow people of notoriety and fame, whether from the sports world or celebrities or decorators or whatever they are, and their lives look really amazing. I mean, they're really good at showing you the price tag costs. You know, what it costs for items. They'll even show you some of the work they've had to do to accomplish this. But they seldom, if ever, tell you the real life costs. See, if we knew the cost of being famous or, or maybe a, a elite at something, Uh, Many of us would not be willing to pay that cost, what it costs our families, what it costs us internally, mentally, emotionally. You might be more content with the life that you actually have. In this series, what we're doing is we are adding up the hidden costs in life to help us count the costs so that we can make better decisions in life. So this is a series about adding up all those hidden costs so that you and I can count the costs and we can make better decisions in life. So next week, Pastor Jessica is going to talk about the hidden cost of sex. Then Pastor Keith is going to talk about the hidden cost of family. Then I'm going to come back and talk about the hidden cost of money. And then we're going to conclude this series by talking about the hidden cost of time. But this week, we're talking about work. And uh, author, pastor, uh, uh, professor Tim Keller says it well when he says this. Work is as much a basic human need as food, beauty, rest, friendship, prayer, and sexuality. It's not simply medicine, but food for our souls. What, what Keller is driving at here is the fact that you and I are actually made to work. We are created, just like God worked in creating this world, he created us for work. But what we need to acknowledge and understand and why work has a hidden cost and sometimes is dangerous is because although work is very important, it's not of ultimate importance. And when we make it of ultimate importance, we pay a very steep price. So I want to read a portion of scripture for you. And it's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. And we're going to, it's going to bleed right into chapter 6 of Ephesians. Now, I've updated the language in this. So you, if you look it up, it's not going to read the same way. I've updated it into 2022 vernacular so that we can really get the meaning of what Paul's driving at when he's talking about work. So these are the words of the Apostle Paul. He says this, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Employees, Obey your earthly bosses with deep respect and fear. Don't worry, we're going to unpack some of this. (laughs) Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. As employees of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do whether we are employees or bosses. Bosses, treat your employees in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven and he has no favorites. This is God's word. This is God's word. So the Apostle Paul is speaking to Christians in in a city called Ephesus and uh, at a church and he's trying to help them to understand that now you're a follower of Jesus. How does that affect your work? whether you're working under people or you're working over people. And it's not a particularly inspiring passage. It's an incredibly practical uh, passage, which makes it an incredibly valuable passage of Scripture. So we're going to explore the hidden costs of work, what that looks like. And to be honest, uh, all of us have had or presently do have an unhealthy relationship with work. 
uh, sin, that thing that toxifies the God's creation and the way he made it to run, has entered into the human experience and it's kind of toxified our relationship with work. And how this unhealthy relationship of work usually reveals itself is by either overworking or underworking. We're either overworking or underworking. So before we jump into the hidden costs of work and the costliness of overworking and underworking, there are three principles that Paul gives us that helps us understand how work should look like for a follower of Jesus. So I wanna explore those three principles. The first work principle is simply this. Remember, when you oversee others, say it with me, respect them, respect them. I mean, that sounds obvious maybe in our present era. Look at verse eight. This is how he says it. He says, bosses, treat your employees in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven and he has no favorites. This seems so obvious to our modern ears. I mean, we have HR departments. We have labor laws that protect our rights as workers. Not in Paul's day. This was quite revolutionary in his day. Uh, when he said, you must respect them. And then he goes further. He says, don't threaten them. Now, in the popular culture of that era, there was contemporaries to Paul. There was a great philosopher in Rome. His name was Seneca. And actually, our own Seneca College here in Toronto gets its name from this Roman philosopher. And that Roman philosopher talked about employees or slaves or people, servants who worked. And these were his words. He, he said, treat your slaves as enemies. That's all they know, power and fear. So in the culture of that day and age, if you were over someone, you used power and fear to get them to do what you wanted them to do. But Paul says, if you're a boss or you're over someone, now that might be in a work context, it might be even in a home. He's saying, uh, if you're a Christian and a follower of Jesus, don't you dare do that. Never threaten. Never threaten. Since you know that you too are an employee, that, that you, from God's point, you're equals. From God's vantage point, you're equals. In other words, we all have a boss. All of us have a boss. And that boss views everyone as equal because we have an ultimate boss, and that is God himself. So work principle number one is simply this. If we oversee people, respect them. I mean, that might sound very elemental, but it's very crucial to our faith witness and our faith walk. The second principle we see here from P P uh, Paul is this. Remember, when you work for someone, respect them. I mean, go figure. Paul's kind of covering both ends of the basis. So in other words, if you have someone that's managing you, someone who's a boss, someone who's over you, the command is to respect them. Here's what it says in verse five and six. Employees, Obey your earthly boss with respect and fear. We'll, we'll get into that in a minute. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Paul's saying to employees, listen, I want you to show respect. I want you to do a good job for your boss. I, I, but I don't want you to ever think that, they, that she is your real boss. She's your earthly boss. She, she's not your ultimate boss but I want you to show the, her the kind of respect that you would show me. This is a game changer for the way we work, and the way we look at work, to respect them as you show respect for me. And that word fear is the problematic one in this verse because when we it's not helpful in the English, to be honest with you. Uh, the Greek word is a little more complex. When we think of fear, we think be frightened of them. <laughs> That's not at all what Paul is saying. When he's, when he's defining fear here, it's the same word we use when you'll see it in scripture about the fear of God or the fear of Jesus or anything like that. It wasn't that you were afraid of them. It's actually a word that meant joyful, astonished awe or wonder. I mean, pretty, pretty elaborate word. So if you rewind to the beginning of our reading, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, where, where Paul says, submit to one another. That's a beautiful, that's great for every marriage relationship, every friendship. How do you submit to one another? But it was in a work context here. How can you submit to one another? We can do that because we are serving a God. We're serving God out of joyful wonder of how he has firstly served us. See, this is the game changer when it comes to remembering to give respect to those that may be over us. 
is we remember how much Jesus has served us. And Paul is saying that just like he served you, we need to serve those that are over us. You, and he served us by, of course, dying for us. Now, this is easy to say, but you got to go to work on Monday. And maybe you despise where you work. Maybe you despise the work that you're doing. Maybe you despise the person that's over you. I, let's talk really frank. Maybe the person over you, your boss, maybe they're a fool. Maybe you could do the job better than they could, and you have a lot of trouble respecting them. How do you go and serve them? Well, easy, really. Easy if you think about what Jesus did. In the Bible, it says that Christ died for you and me while we were yet enemies. I mean, not just, not just, not just fools. We were enemies. He served us. He worked for us. And he died for us while we were his enemies. If he could serve his enemies, we can go to work and, and serve someone who's a little foolish. We can go to work and serve someone that we don't quite jive with because we're not recognizing they're not our ultimate boss. They may be an earthly boss, but we're working for someone larger than that, someone over that. So if you're, over some, if you're overseeing people, Paul says, respect them. If you're serving under people, Paul says, respect them. So there should be respect going both ways. And then here's the third principle we see here. The third principle is, work principle is simply this. Remember, all honest work is good work. It's God's work. Can you say that out loud with me? Remember, all honest work is good work. It's God's work. It's God's work. Here's what it says in verse 7. He says, work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord. Remember, the ultimate boss rather than for people. Martin Luther was the great reformer of the church, uh, uh, and he caught on to this principle during the Reformation. There's a group of people who knew the church had kind of lost its way, and they were called reformers. And one of the principles they built, the battle cry of the Reformation, was simply this. You're saved by faith and grace, not by good works. That was one of the foundational truths of the Reformation that happened in the 1400s. But it, there was a further, there was a second battle cry. There were two main pillars of the Reformation. The first one, you're saved by faith and grace. The second one was, was the priesthood of all believers. Martin Luther taught that there was a priesthood in all believers. Now remember, uh, you may not know this, but Luther was a monk. And in his day, the monks, the nuns, the priests, they were the ones that were called by God. They had holy orders from God. They were called by God. Everyone else, everyone else was just out there working. They were involved in the sacred while everyone else was involved in the secular. Stuff that's not going to last, stuff, that, stuff that's uh, not, not as important, not as important. And against the backdrop of Ephesians chapter 6, Luther wrote this treatment in this time of Reformation. And he was teaching that now some of the language, he talked about milkmaids and different roles that we don't have in our modern culture. But he, he, he would say this, that basically caregivers and janitors and researchers and businesswomen, they have as high and honorable as a calling as a priest or a pastor or a preacher. It's as high and it's as honorable as any other calling. How can that be? Well, you have to go back to the original creation in Genesis chapter 1, in Genesis chapter 1, we see all work is necessary for human flourishing. See, work is something that wasn't a result of the fall or when sin came into this world. Work was around before it. See, God worked. He created. He used effort. He worked. And he, we are made in his image. We were all made to work. And now in our world today, there are lower skilled work and sometimes they're less paid, and there's higher skilled work, and sometimes they get uh, elevated. There's a pecking order to work in this world, but not so with God. God doesn't look at it that way, not like our world does. He doesn't show favoritism. That's what we just read in Ephesians chapter 6. He, he shows no favoritism, or an older portion of Scripture translated it this way. He was no respecter of persons, meaning he doesn't respect someone more than someone else because they're maybe deemed as being more important. No, he sees us as equals. See, the fact is, no matter who you are, we're all engaged in different levels of work. Uh, here's a reality. Somebody, somebody needs to clean the countertops in your apartment or you will die. 
what, I, what am I talking about? Hygiene. I mean, someone has to sweep the floors, wash the sheets, clean the bathroom. Uh, you have to do the nasty, dirty, sometimes domestic work of cleaning up or you're going to die. It's all a part of staying healthy. It's part of the human order. It's about flourishing and thriving as a human. It doesn't always pay well, but it's critical work. All work is critical work. All work is critical work. Just for a moment, think of whatever your work may be. It might be volunteer work, might be domestic work, might be paid work, whatever it is. What if you saw your work less like getting a paycheck and more like a calling from God? Now, you may not be doing the job you want to do right now, but, but just imagine wherever you are right now, God has called you to be there. That should, as followers of Jesus, position us to treat people differently when we're there. Because we need to acknowledge some of the doctrine here, that all work is God's calling. So those that are around us, above us, below us, all work is God's calling. Everyone is made in the image of God. So we have equal value, male, female, no matter what our, our background is, race-wise, whatever, whatever our, our, or our position or status in life, everyone has an equality built in them that we're all made in the image of God. And as we just saw from Luther, we're all saved by grace. We're all saved by grace, not by works. So whether it's domestic chores, whether it's investment banking, whether it's rocket science, whether you're an electrical engineer or a, custodi a custodian, doesn't matter. All work is God's work. All work is God's work. And all of these doctrines point to the same thing. Don't you dare think, because maybe you're a highly trained professional, that you're better than someone who's cleaning windows, or you're better than someone that might be doing domestic duties or who's a doorman somewhere. You're not. And it doesn't give us a right to treat anyone with less respect. They're all doing God's work. There's, there's a great theologian. I, I don't think I've ever quoted him in a weekend gathering, but I've read a, a lot of him. He's probably informed many of my teachings over the years. His name is R.C. Sproul. And uh, I, I like his name because that's my wife's maiden name, Sproul. Uh, but R.C. Sproul was actually studying this portion of scripture in Ephesians chapter 6. And he was thinking about what Paul meant by this. And he actually had to do a hospital visit. And he talks about waiting in the waiting room of a hospital. And he recognized quickly that there's a caste system in the hospital. Now, I'm not picking on you medical professionals because there's a caste system in every workplace. But in particular, he's focused on what was going on in the hospital. And he recognized that you have your top doctors. Then you, then you have your other doctors. Then you have your residents. And, and then as you go down, you have nurses. Then you'd have administrators. And then you had other skilled technical people uh, that were a part of the medical community. And at the very bottom, you had housekeeping. Housekeeping. And he realized there's a pecking order. And there was a way by which other people let other people know, you're not at my level. You're not at my level. In fact, in this one exchange, he witnessed a, a nurse with a group of doctors, very animated, very alert, very participating in the conversation. And when she walked down the hallway, she passed a man from housekeeping who was pushing some soiled linens down the, down the, down the hallway. He looked up to greet her, and she looked away and put her head down. Uh, I mean... We look at that and we think at one level, man, well, that's wrong, or maybe she's having a bad day. But let's all acknowledge, there is a pecking order. There's a caste system that seems to happen in our world and in our workplaces. I love what the boxing legend Muhammad Ali said. He said this. He said, I don't trust anyone who's nice to me but rude to the waiter because they would treat me the same way if I was in that position. Ouch. Ouch. The human heart, because of sin, is always trying to get a leg up on the people around us. It's only the gospel of grace that kind of cleanses away that our need to stand on somebody, to lord over somebody. Paul is saying, respect one another. That's what he's saying, respect one another. Never forget, how no matter how menial the task may be, no matter how dirty the job is, no matter how humbling the job may be or how mundane the job may be, when you're serving the Lord, all work is a calling from God. All work is a calling from God. 
So where do the hidden costs come in, Jonathan? Well, there's, there's hidden costs associated when work becomes either overreaching or underreaching, when we overwork or we underwork. Here's what Paul said in verse 8 of Ephesians. He said this, Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do, whether we are employees or bosses. Paul's reminding us that, you know, our payment for render, services rendered ultimately comes from God, not from our companies, not from our immediate bosses. He wants us to remember. He doesn't want us to miss this because when we miss this and we think it actually comes from our boss, it changes us. We either overwork or we underwork as a result of that if we don't understand who our ultimate boss is. And when we overwork, and this is a problem in the city of Toronto. This is a problem for you, problem for me, problem for many of us in the city of Toronto. Too often we ignore the hidden costs associated with overworking. And I, I think we overwork for many reasons. I think if some of us were honest, sometimes we get more from work than we get from home. And maybe even we cheat towards work because it helps us avoid dealing with things at home. We got a messy marriage, we got a uh, troubled kid, uh, there's friction in the home, and so we just kind of cheat towards work and we throw ourselves in there and we overwork that instead of working on those things at home. Because there, people applaud us. We're at home, they ask us to do stuff, right? And, and so everybody is anxious. Have you noticed that? Everybody's career-oriented. Everybody's pushing. Everybody's under such pressure. And we tend to overwork. We tend to leave our best at work. We leave the best work we have at work. And we leave the leftovers for those people in our lives that might be significant. They get, they, all they get is the leftovers. And to be honest, also too, sometimes it's because we're searching for such significance and need in our lives. We have a need for meaning and significance. And it's easy. The work promises you the world, but it can't deliver. And we throw ourselves into it because we're looking for significance in that moment. Friends, if you do your work and you put in a good day's work, you do your best at it. And sometimes when you see that maybe people aren't noticing that you do good work, or maybe you don't seem to be getting a breakthrough or you don't seem to be successful, or you don't seem to be getting into the school you want it. Often we think the solution is to, to overwork or underwork. Overwork because we just need to push, for, I gotta double my efforts to get through. Or we underwork, we kind of give up, like I'm not, I'm not even gonna try anymore. And both of them are a trap. See, uh, both of them are rooted in what other people think about us. Uh, let me have a little grown-up conversation with you. One I've had to have with me in the mirror on a, on a few occasions. Who cares? Who cares? What matters is what Christ thinks. What matters is what Jesus thinks. He's the only boss who's going to be around a million years from now. He's the only boss that's going to be around. All the rest of them will be gone. <laughs> Your professors will be gone. Your bosses will be gone. Your bank, gone. Your bank account, it will be gone. He's the only one. Who cares what they think? All that matters, all that matters is what Jesus thinks. Just do your best and relax. This is the cure for overworking. Hey, do your best. Bring your best effort. Paul says to work with wholeheartedly, one translation says. To work with enthusiasm, this translation said. So we bring our best and all that matters is what Jesus thinks. We need to do our best and relax. That's the rem remedy for overworking. See, when you look at Jesus dying on the cross, as he did for all of us, you need to just remember that Jesus is the only boss that will forgive you and die for you. That's why he's the ultimate boss. Jesus is the only boss that is going to forgive you and die for you. Your career will not die for you. You know, your career will use you. Jesus never uses you. He's the only person you come to in this life who exceeds your expectations when you interact with him. If you make your career your master and you fail at it, you're, you're, it it'll kill you. you. You'll have self-hatred and self-loathing because you put all of your chips on your career. You made it an ultimate. Listen, call no one your master but Jesus. Call no one your master but Christ. So if you overwork, there's a, there's a trap there. I'll, I'll tell you the cost in just a minute. 
And if you underwork, there's a trap there. Some of us have an, un, and the problem with the underworking is you can't see it in you. You can only see it in others. That's scary. That's scary. I, I worked with a, a guy, another church, a number of years ago, and I could tell he was struggling at work. And he always seemed to be dropping balls. Something was wrong. And so I, I had him in my office. I said, are you okay? And he just said, like, I'm overwhelmed. I just feel overworked. And I was like, I, was like, well, I don't want an environment where someone's overworked. Listen, we have busy seasons, but you can't sustain that long term. That's, that's unhealthy. I want a, a healthy life-giving rhythm for everyone who works on my team. So I, I said, listen, if it's helpful, I do this every year. I do what I call time mapping. And I take everything I do in a two-week uh, time frame, and I break it down into details because I want to see where my time actually goes. So he said, okay, I'll do it. And he met with me two weeks later, and I didn't want to see his time map. I w- this wasn't about his performance. This was about his health. Uh, but his honesty, when he came back, I asked him, how'd it go? I almost burst out laughing because he was way too honest with me. He said this, and I, I wrote down what he said because I found it in- in- riveting. He said, I discovered, he said, I-, I discovered, Jonathan, I don't know how to work. Okay, and he goes on to say, I realized quickly that I don't have too much to do. Instead, I waste a lot of time overthinking, procrastinating, and being unproductive. I I mean, that was pretty honest to tell your boss that. Uh, But I admired him for his honesty. What I found over the years is when we're not a good fit for a role, or we're not in a good place emotionally or mentally, we often feel overworked. And often we're actually underworking. But our minds are incredibly busy. But our hands are very, very latent in those moments. Paul is pointing out that many people underwork because they're not in a good place or they don't particularly like their job. You ever been in a job you didn't like? I've done a lot of things I didn't like. And sometimes when we, we're doing a work we don't like, we, we can, as a result, underwork. Or if we're working for people we don't like, we maybe despise management, and it can cause us to underwork. Uh, or only work hard when they're looking, right? You ever been there? Well, the boss is here, everybody starts working, whatever that looks like. Paul gives you this revolutionary principle, though. He says this, he says, your real supervisor is always watching. So if you're underworking, he reminds you, listen, remember, you're not working. For, for that person, for her, for him. You're working for me. Therefore, always do a good job. Always do a good job. Serve wholeheartedly. Work with all your might. It's a trap to overwork and it's a trap to underwork. So how do you avoid both? There's a, there's a really great exchange in Luke chapter five and I'm not gonna read it all to you. If you've been around church or the gospels, you'll, you'll know this right away, where Jesus calls these workers, these fishermen, And he says, leave your nets and follow me. I will make you fishers of men. You remember that text? I'll make you fishers of men. What is that teaching us in this context? Well, well, Jesus is saying, listen, I have fishing beyond your fishing. If you're an artist, he's saying, I have art beyond your art. If you're a business person, I have business beyond your business. In other words, there's, there's an ultimate boss with an ultimate vision for life. And if you can keep it in that order, it'll enable you to walk away from your nets at the end of the day. It'll be, enable you to actually rest at the end of the day. You know, especially in Toronto, this is important. I've met many people, and you might be one of those people. And I've been that person that can't walk away from my work to care for my family. That can't walk away, can't turn it off. Can't, can't stop it. And I can't walk away from my nets or put my nets down to take care of my body or to take care of my soul. And Jesus is saying, listen, you can keep catching fish. That's, that's okay. Keep working. But there's going to be a moment where you need to let go of your nets and follow after me. There's always going to be wealth beyond the wealth that you're trying to accumulate in this life. If you want to have true significance and meaning, find your rest in me. Find your rest in me. This, fee- this frees us from work mastering us, driving us, and defining us. And that's what we, you know, when, when work drives us, defines us, and masters us, it's a cruel taskmaster. It'll drive you into the ground. It takes no prisoners. What are the hidden costs? You know, it, 
the irony in this, and we're going to conclude with this, the irony is it's the same hidden cost for those who overwork or those who underwork. It's the same costly thing. See, when you overwork, it's because it promises you something. When you overwork, it's promising you, hey, if you just do a little bit more, you'll get more success. You'll, you'll have more wealth. And so there's this temptation that you overwork to get or to get, or it's people think you're important. People think you're significant. And if you've ever watched someone retire from a workplace, you know that they're soon after forgotten. All the significance you had in that pathway evaporates in that moment. But, but if you're working for God, it's something larger than just that work place, setting, and moment. And the irony is, when you underwork, it promises to add to your life. It promises to add ease in your life. You know, I'm going to take it easy here. I'm just going to take it easy. And even, it even promises you a sense of justice. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you don't like your boss, or you don't like your work, or you don't feel, you feel hard done by in life, you know, it's a way of getting even. You know what? I'm going to do what I have to do and nothing else. I'm going to do what I have to do and nothing else. Now, I hope that's not you because if you're a follower of Jesus, that should never be our attitude. But here's, here's, what, here's a couple of ways the hidden cost of work robs us. It robs you of joy. It'll rob you of joy. If you overwork, you're going to miss so many significant moments in life where pausing and resting and recreating would add so much joy. And joy for the follower of Jesus is strength. It actually fuels your work if you do those rhythms properly in your life. It's, uh, if you're overworked, man, I, uh, we'll have a link outside this uh, text to a previous teaching in February that Pastor Keith gave on Sabbath keeping. And it's God's rhythm to resting so that overworking doesn't destroy our souls, our spirits, our bodies, and our families. So there's, it robs you of joy. It robs you of joy. If, if you underwork, it robs you of joy. Because if you underwork, often it's because you feel hard done by. And eventually as you underwork, it chips away at you. It chips away at your confidence. It chips away at the meaning. It chips away at your soul. It robs you of joy. So Underwork promises you a life of ease. Overwork promises you a life of success. And they both rob you. They rob you blind. They don't just rob you of joy. They actually rob you of your family and significant relationships. When you overwork, you miss out. When you underwork, your family misses out. You see, when you, when you overwork, you, you may even be present at a birthday party, but you, maybe you've been in the season. I have, I have a real problem with this. I have to work hard at it. I'm present, but I'm actually still at work. In my mind, I'm still at work. I'm ruminating over situations. I'm trying to figure out ways. And, I, and I have, I, I have, I'm a person without boundaries. And a person without boundaries, scripture says, is dangerous. Dangerous to their family, dangerous to themselves. So overworking robs you of your family. And underworking robs your family. It takes from your family. Uh, because when you're under work, you actually put more burden on your family. Uh, I've watched some people in a, in a partnership, in a, a spousal relationship or marriage, where one overworks because the other chronically underworks. Now, every partnership can have different levels of energy and everything else and different callings. I'm not talking about that. And sometimes there's season. Shelly stayed home with our boys in a season. That was, an, uh, that was a lot of domestic work she took on herself. It's as valuable and crucial as the work I do. So I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying that when we underwork, we often cheat our families of opportunities and moments. Friends, let me just summarize it this way. No job is worth losing your wife or your kids over or your spouse, your partner, whoever. It's not worth it. No job is worth exchanging your health for wealth. No job no job is worth losing God for a fraud. This facsimile of success and meaning in life. Paul says this, treat everyone with respect. Treat those that you work for with respect. I will when they're more respectable. That's not what he's saying. You treat them like you respect me. And then treat those that are under you with great respect. Don't threaten them. Take care of them. You're responsible for them. And then he says this, remember Remember who your boss is. 
Your ultimate boss is Jesus. And all work is given by God and all work is crucial. So I know I said at the beginning, this is not a, so much an inspiring uh, passage, but it's a practical passage which has incredible, valuable implications to our life. And if you're a follower of Jesus, it means that we should be some of the best people to have on any team in any workplace. Let me conclude in prayer with you and then Pastor Matt will come with some next steps. Let's pray together. And it might be helpful for you to hold your hands out in front of you and just hold your job or your workplace. Get that in mind right now. Whether you work at home and, and you're more in charge of some domestic things or you're raising children right now or you're in a corporate setting or you're in a, in a, a blue-collar setting, whatever that work is, God loves work. And it's, if it's honorable work, if it's honest work, it's honorable work and it's as valuable God doesn't distinguish between them. We need it all. So we want to be good stewards, though, of what God has placed in our hands. Let's pray. Father, these are practical and almost oversimplistic principles. Yet many of us find ourselves in work settings that can be brutal, brutal and difficult and even hard. And even those of us who have a job we love, we acknowledge today that work has a way of running us into the ground. Many of us have jobs that, that maybe are difficult right now. And some of us have jobs we can't even stand. Or maybe we're working with people that are very difficult. God, we need your help. We need your grace. Thank you for scripture that tells us it's possible. It's possible to serve you and to have a work life that has meaning and satisfaction regardless of our circumstances. We pray, Lord, that you'll teach us how Teach us how to work, to do excellent work, to do it wholeheartedly, to do it with enthusiasm, but not to overwork. Teach us, God, and help us to do our work with enthusiasm and, uh, and, and uh, 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 wholeheartedly, but not underwork, God. We pray that you would show us how this applies to us in our setting. What are the implications for us? Holy Spirit, illuminate them so we can see them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. If you found this helpful, we hope you join us at one of our campuses if you're in the GTA for a weekend gathering. If you're listening from somewhere else in the world, we'd encourage you to join us at onechurch.to slash live. We believe everyone can be a part of what Jesus is doing, both in our community and in our city. So if you'd like to connect with us at a deeper level, visit us at onechurch.to slash next steps. See you next time.